Hi, and welcome back to Common Core Algebra 2. Today's lesson is 9.1, Imaginary Numbers. So recall that in the real number system, it is not always possible to take the square root of a negative quantity because whenever a real number is squared, it's non-negative. This fact has been has a ramification for finding the x-intercepts of a parabola as shown here in exercise 1. So in exercise 1, on the x-axis below, a sketch of y equals x squared is shown. Now consider the parabola whose equation is given in the function notation f of x equals x squared plus 1. Now before we even consider what this looks like, let's look at it on our calculator. So as you can see, it ships the whole parabola up one unit. So in this case, there are no x-intercepts, there are no roots, there are no zeros, there are no solutions to this equation. So let's go back. So how is this graph y equals x squared shifted to produce the graph of f of x? I'm sorry, shifted to produce the graph of f of x. So basically what we're going to say is that um, f of x shifts up one unit. B says create a quick sketch of f of x on the axis below. Now, based on what we saw on our calculator, it shifts up one, but then it kind of looks the same as y equals x squared. C says what can be said about the x-intercepts of the function y equals f of x? And basically, we can say it does not have any. x-intercepts. Then D says, algebraically, show that these intercepts do not exist in the real number system by solving the incomplete quadratic x squared plus 1. Now, there's two ways that we can approach this. We can actually use the quadratic formula, and you can use the quadratic formula by saying a is equal to 1, b is equal to 0 because we have no linear term, and c is equal to 1 and plug it in. But when it talks about an incomplete quadratic, what that means is we can simply do this, equals 0. Just like we solve a linear equation, we can say x squared is equal to negative 1. And then in, what's the opposite? How do we undo x squared? We take the square root. So we have x is equal to positive and negative, the square root of negative 1, which of course we know we can't do. But this is what we're introducing. We're introducing the number i. So the imaginary number i is equal to the square root of negative 1. So in this case, we would say x is equal to positive or negative i. Write down what you need to, and I'll meet you at exercise 2. Okay, so the definition of the imaginary number i, it's right there at the top of your page. i equals the square root of negative 1. So let's look at exercise number two. Now remember, when we do this, we're going to break this up the same way we did before. We're going to break it up into the real portion, and in this case, the imaginary portion. So this is going to be 9 times negative 1, and we know the square root of 9 is 3, and we know the square root of 1 is i. We can do the same thing with the square root of negative 100. So we have the square root of 100 times the square root of negative 1, square root of 100 is 10, the square root of negative 1 is i. Now this one we're going to have to break up a little bit differently because now we're going to have a rational portion, an irrational portion, and an imaginary portion. So square root of 32, we know that negative 1 is going to be here. And 32 breaks up into the perfect square, 16 times 2. Remember, it's got to be the largest number, the largest perfect square you can take out of 16. I'm sorry, out of 32, which is 16. Um, so square root of 16 is 4. Square root of 2 times this i. Now that's kind of weird to write it that way. So generally what we try and do is we bring the i next to the 4, square root of 2, so we don't get it confused whether it's under the radical or not under the radical. X 
and with D, it's going to be the same thing. So hopefully it pops in your head very quickly that 18 is the square root of 9 times the square root of 2 because 9 is a perfect square. Don't forget about that negative 1 that hangs off the back. So this becomes 3 square root of 2. And remember, we have to add this i in, and we're going to add that i after the 3. Just notation looks better. All right, so pause this. Take a look at this one more time, and then we can move on to exercise number 3. So how do we use this? So when you look at examples of quadratics, like we have in exercise three, we're going to says place your answers in simplest radical form. It's really important to make sure that you're looking to see how they want the answers to be represented. So we have a quadratic here in letter A. And once again, when we solve quadratics, we get everything to the left-hand side, set it equal to zero. So the first thing I'm going to do is add 12 to both sides and I get 5x squared is equal to, I'm sorry, there's two ways you can do this. Two ways that we can do this. So if you think about the way we were just talking about it, we would have 5x squared plus 20 is equal to 0. Now you would factor out the 5, get x squared plus 4 is equal to 0. And now at this point, you can do this one of two ways. 5 can equal 0, so we can, we can actually the 5 becomes irrelevant in this situation. So we can solve this two ways. We can solve it saying a is equal to 1, b is equal to 0, and c is equal to 4. Or once again, we can do it the way we just did in the other problem as an incomplete quadratic, minus 4 from both sides. We have x squared is equal to negative 4. So now when you take the square root of both sides, I'm going to remind you the answer will always be plus and minus. So instead of saying the square root of negative 4, we're going to say the square root of 4 times the square root of negative 1, which of course is equal to plus and minus 2i. Remember, that's two answers, positive 2i and negative 2i. Okay, moving on to B. This also is going to be incomplete. B and C are both incomplete quadratics. So it means that we can solve it the way we solve linear equations because we do not have a linear term. So the first thing I'm going to do with B is I'm going to bring the 2 to the 20. Let's bring the 20 over, just like we do with linear equations. So we have 1 half x squared is equal to negative 18. And now we have to get rid of that 1 half. So multiply both sides by 2, and x squared is equal to negative 36. So now when you take the square root of both sides, x is equal to positive and negative, the square root of negative 36, which hopefully you're getting a little bit um, more comfortable with, which is going to be plus and minus 6i. So why don't you pause the video at this point and try C on your own. So there's the solution to C. Now how I wrote this, instead of writing plus and minus 4i, I wrote positive 4i and negative 4i. Sometimes that's um, an easier way to recognize it, to recognize that you actually have two solutions to our problem, because some people can get confused with that positive negative 6i, forgetting, like if you're looking at this one here in the middle, that this means that it's 6i and negative 6i. Okay? So remember, we're not just writing this down, we're trying to really understand where these numbers come from. So please take a moment, try to understand it, pause it, rewind it before we move on to exercise four. Sorry about that, okay. So which of the following is equivalent to five i times six i? Well, we have 5i 
times 6i. And when we multiply, we multiply the real portions first. So 5 times 6 is 30. And now we multiply the imaginary parts where we get i squared. So if we know the square root of negative 1 is equal to i, what is i squared going to equal? When you square this and you square this, well, what happens to this radical when you square it? It comes away. So I know that i squared is equal to negative 1. So this is equal to 30 times negative 1, which is negative 30, which is sitting right here at number 3. Now, as we move on to exercise 5, we're going to piggyback on that and looking at, look at the other powers of i. So we're going to start looking for a pattern here. So basically, simplify each of the following powers of i. So as I started here, I said i to the 0 power, we know anything to the 0 power is equal to 1. i to the first power is i, and we just determined in our last um, example that i squared is equal to negative 1. So what is i cubed going to be? Well, i cubed is going to be i squared times i. So i squared is negative 1 times i is going to be negative i. Don't get this confused with an i. This is a 1. So now as we go to i to the fourth power, well, i to the fourth power is going to be i to the third power. I'll do it up here. It's going to be i to the third power times i. We know i to the third power is negative i. We're going to multiply that by i, and we get negative i squared. Well, negative i squared is simply going to be negative 1, negative 1 with a negative out in front, which is a positive 1. I to the fifth is simply going to be I to the fourth times I, which is going to be I. I to the sixth is going to be I to the fifth times I, which is negative 1. And I to the seventh is going to be I to the sixth times I, which is negative I. So hopefully you're starting to see a pattern here. So why don't you finish doing um, the whole next column? So hopefully you realize that i to the 8th is 1, i to the 9th is i, i to the 10th is negative 1, and i to the 11th is negative i. So this starts getting us into a pattern of remainders of 4. So for example, when we do, if we were going to do i to the 12th power, well I know i to the 12th power should give me 1 again, but what I think about here is I say 12 divided by 4 is equal to 3 with a remainder of 0. So when it has a remainder of 0, I know it's going to be the same as i to the 0 power, which is 1. So how about we pick other numbers? How about i to the 20th? Oh, let's try 21st power. i to the 21st power is going to be 21 divided by 4 is equal to 5, but I don't care about what it's equal to. I'm concerned about what the remainder is. The remainder is 1, because 5, 4 goes into 21 5 times, which is 20, with a remainder of 1, which means this is the same thing as i to the first power, which is equal to i. So you can pick crazy numbers. How about i to the 53rd power? So i to the 53 is going to be basically 53 divided by 4, and that goes in one time with one left over. It goes in three times. So this also has a remainder of 1. So I know this is the same thing as i to the first power, which is i. All right, so that's basically how we can take large um, powers of i and be able to figure out very quickly what the... Um, what the value is. So figure out a number like i to the, I don't know, maybe the 15th power. That's going to be 15 divided by 4, which is going to have a remainder of 3, right? It's going to go in uh, 3 times, which is 12, 13, 14, 15. So this is going to have a remainder of 3. 
So what is I to the third? You can slide back up here. You know that I to the third is equal to negative I. All right? So why don't you take a look at exercise six and try to do them on your own. And then we'll take a look at exercise seven quickly and then we're going to call it a day. So in A, it's 38 divided by 4, which is going to ha be um, 8 with a remainder of 2. And you can do that. 8 remainder of 2. Remember when you used to do it back in second grade? Remainder of 2. So you know that this is the same thing as I to the second power, and which we figured out is negative 1. <laughs> 21 divided by 4 is equal to 5 with a remainder of 1, right? So we know this is going to be the same thing as i to the first power, which is i. 83 divided by 4 is equal to 20 with a remainder of 3. So this is the same thing as i to the third power, which is negative i. And 40 divided by 4 is equal to 10 with a remainder of 0, which is the same thing as i to the 0 power, which is 1. Don't get my 1s and my i's mixed up, which is 1. Okay, hopefully you didn't find them too difficult. So when you look at exercise 7, which looks like a crazy hard problem, it's really not that bad. So i to the 16th, so I'm going to do these individually. i to the 16th is going to be 16 divided by 4, which is 4 remainder 0. So I know i to the 16th is going to equal 1. So I know so far I have 5 times 1 plus 3 times. Now let's go to i to the 23rd. So 23 divided by 4 is equal to 5 with a remainder of 3. So this is the same thing as i to the third power, which is equal to negative i. So I know this is going to be times negative i plus i to the 26th power. It's going to be 26 divided by 4, which is um, 6, 24 with a remainder of 2. So that's the same thing as negative 1. So I get 5 plus, oh, actually it's going to be minus, right? So 5 minus 3i minus 1, combine like terms, and we're going to get 4 minus 3i as my answer, which is right here at number 2. All right, that bell's just about to ring. I hear you all coming in. So until next time, make good choices, rewind if you need to, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.